Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I will never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> well, what we're talking about tonight is discipleship. Now, a lot of concepts, huh? I know. Always, always coming up with new stuff. <laughs> you know, a lot of concepts in the church, they get made out to be more than they should be. They get turned into a high-minded, over-difficult idea that you feel like you need a seminary degree to understand. Things like grace and faith and discipleship, I, in my sight, are the primary victims. But that's not how good teaching is supposed to work. It's awful easy to take something simple and make it complicated. Good teaching and good theology takes something complicated and makes it simple. That's what Jesus always did. He would take a big, high-minded concept and he'd just make it simple. Now, discipleship is important and grossly misunderstood. See, when we hear the word disciple, we automatically think, or at least I automatically think, of Jesus' 12 disciples. And that's fine. They're named disciples for a reason. But what we do then usually is we start comparing ourselves to those disciples. If I asked a random Christian if they're a disciple of Jesus, the answer I expect is, you know, I, I don't know. I hope so. You know, may, maybe on a good day. Maybe on a good day I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus. You see, we compare our blooper reels to someone else's highlight reel. And that ain't how it's supposed to work. When we think of Peter, we think of Peter as the rock upon which Jesus built the church. Named him Cephas for that reason. And we, we know, but it's not often the first thing we think about, that Peter denied Jesus three times on the night of the crucifixion. Huh? Before the rooster crowed, that's right. We think of Thomas as the doubter when he also took the gospel to India and was martyred for it. We know that Judas Iscariot was the betrayer of Jesus. We know that John is the one whom Jesus loved. Two of Jesus' blood brothers, half-brothers, were among the twelve disciples. See, they're all disciples. And Jesus tells us to make disciples of all the nations in the Great Commission. If we go to Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. Baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining in you remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even unto the end of the age. I love how the Amplified Bible says that making disciples means helping people to learn about Jesus, believe in Jesus, and obey Jesus' words. Now that does come with some balance. When Jesus was alive before the resurrection, before his resurrection, he was teaching the law of Moses. We don't live under the law of Moses. We live under grace. So there is some balance to be observed. But it doesn't say we become disciples by trying harder. You see, we know what we're supposed to do. We're given two rules. We're told to love God and love people the same way we love ourselves. And we try to do that under our own power. We tell God, you know, it's the start of the new year, and people get reflective at, at the start of the new year, and they go, 
God, I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to listen to more Christian music. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And you might at the beginning, but before too long, you're not. You're not. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to turn everything in on time all the way done. I've been in school too long. (laughs) I was in school too long. Now I just work at one. I'm going to do this, and whatever else we've failed at over and over, the problem is, but you're you're not going to succeed doing those things on your own strength. I love you dearly, and I tell you enough, and I I love you enough to tell you that if you do it that way, you're going to fail. Nothing you don't know, but sometimes it helps to hear it from another mouth. You see, we know what to do, but we haven't been told how to do it right some of the time. Sometimes a lot of the time. And that's what discipleship is. Discipleship is learning how to do it right. Another way to think about it, discipleship is being a student in the school of Jesus. I know it sounds funny. I see that face back there. I know it sounds funny, but stick with me. You see, it eliminates a lot of confusion about whether or not you're a disciple of Jesus. Are you enrolled in the school? See, there's a welding college, a welding school down in Grain Valley, right there on the northeast, northwest corner of 70 and Buckner Tarsney Road. And if I asked you, are you enrolled in the welding college? You know what answer you're not going to give me? You know, I don't know. I hope so. Maybe on a good day. You either are or you ain't. You either are a disciple of Jesus or you ain't. I didn't ask if you were passing the classes. I didn't ask if you were getting into fights with people at the school. I asked if you were enrolled. And in discipleship school, our enrollment is automatic on salvation. Whether or not we turn up is a different thing. But enrollment's automatic, and the tuition's paid for. If If we think of discipleship as kind of a trade school, it's a lot closer to the reality of the situation than you might think. You go in knowing nothing. See, I'm going to pick on electricians because I can't see the electrons moving that makes electricity work. But the lights are on, so I'm going to assume it works. They're not powered by witchcraft and bicycles. At least not here they're not. So you go in on day one, and you know nothing. You know what the word for knowing nothing is at a trade school? Apprentice. You are the apprentice. And you learn from a master. Now, the school of Jesus only has one master. It's in the name. It's Jesus. People think that Jesus is the master, and that's another part where people get confused. You see, people think that Jesus is the master in that school looking over like the angry headmaster in the movie, what is it, Matilda. Or he's disinterested like Ben Stein was in Ferris Bueller. Bueller, Bueller, that ain't Jesus. That's nothing like Jesus. Now, we think that partially because that's how the church has acted. And partially, because we haven't defended Jesus' character from assaults outside the body. And so we think that he is what he ain't. But Jesus is just Jesus. Jesus is invested in your success. He's not looking to boot you from the program. I want you to take a moment. I don't know where you stopped in your education. I'm assuming you went to some school at least. I would hope you did. If nothing else, you went to driving school because everyone in this room has a license. And I want you to think of your favorite teacher. I'm not asking for names. I'm not looking for a character portrait. Just think about that favorite teacher you had. Now, I'm willing to bet that they were kind, that they were patient, they were compassionate, and they would bend, you, they would bend over backward 
to help you understand and to help you succeed. You see, I had all kinds of teachers when I was in school. For those of you who may not know, I got a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry back in 2015 when I was granted my release from UMKC. And then they brought me back in 2018 and they decided to pay me, so I figured I'd go. I had one teacher, these are all different chemistry teachers I had, who taught his class. It was scheduled to start at 7.40 in the morning. Now, I don't know if y'all have been to school, but most classes don't start until 8.00. Because the school understands that sleep is a thing, and they want to be kind to their student. But this was a mandatory class. I bet there were 400 people in that lecture hall. And he started at 7.40 in the morning with the lights off, reading slides in a monotone off the projector while he was drinking coffee. You had people drooling all over their laptops. It was not a good thing. There was, a t there was another teacher who would ramble. He would, his train of thought would just go off over here, and he'd ramble and he'd tell stories that had nothing to do with the coursework. I like him as an individual. I couldn't stand him as a teacher. And then the class would be, it was the kind of class where the work you do on the problem, or the problems you do in class are 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the homework is, you know, 3 times 7 equals 21, and it's calculus when you get to the test. It was that kind of class. Very frustrating. It almost seemed intentionally cruel, to be honest with you. But I had another teacher who would answer emails at ungodly hours at night. I never sent them at this time because I was sleeping. But she would answer emails at 2 o'clock in the morning because she was up already and she wanted her student to succeed. And the last one I'll tell you about, when I took a class with them, they had been with the school for 40 years. They treated us as an equal. I remember before that semester of class, I promise I'll get off the nostalgia train in a moment, before that semester of class, I was in my third or fourth year of school, and he sent out an email that said, hi, I'm your professor for this class. And you know, I never thought it was fair that I got to know everything about you and you don't really get to know anything about me. So here's my resume. If you've got any questions, send me an email. Now, I personally think it was an intimidation tactic. We found out he graduated, his, under, his bachelor's was from Stanford, and his graduate was from MIT. He had been with the university s for 40 years. He had been a visiting professor at UC Berkeley in California for three years in the 80s. I felt like it was intimidation. I don't think that's how he meant it, but that's kind of how it felt. But, if, but he was so determined for us to succeed that every unit we were assigned asking a question. It was our job to pay enough attention and to be up on the material enough to ask a pertinent question in class at some point in that unit. And if he didn't know the answer, he'd tell you. He'd say, I don't know, that's good. That's a good question, but I don't know. I'll get back to you. And he would. You can guess which of those four teachers I appreciated more. You can guess which ones I would send Christmas cards to. If we go to 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, But as for you, continue in the things that you have learned and of which you are convinced, holding tightly to the truths, knowing from whom you learned them, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings, the Hebrew scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, surrendering your entire self to him and having absolute confidence in his wisdom, power, and goodness. All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, which is learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man or woman of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, Jesus is better than your best teacher. Every school I know of has a textbook of some sort or other. This is ours. You can get whichever translation you want. I'm sure there's more than 60. 
just in English. Do you know which one, you know which Bible is the best Bible for you? The one you'll read and the one that makes sense to you. The Holy Spirit will cover the gaps. You read the one that makes sense to you. But if you're not in it, you don't know what it says. If you're not in it, it's harder to know what God sounds like when he's talking to you. You see, I like, there's another verse, and I don't remember where it is, but it says the Holy Spirit will bring things into your remembrance. I want to say it's somewhere in John 16 when Jesus is talking to the disciples. But the trouble is, if you haven't read it, or you haven't heard it, if this word hasn't gotten into you somehow, you can't remember it because it, you didn't hear it to, in the first place. This is our textbook. And it's a wonderful thing because it's alive. It knows what you need. Because the God who wrote it knows what you need. And the Holy Spirit living in you gets its direction from God. They all work together. Every country I know learns from books or living examples in front of them. And this Bible we teach out of, that's our book. You'll see throughout the scriptures we use tonight how the Bible and the examples we find in the Bible are what we're supposed to be learning from. We're not learning just from stories of someone saying, oh, I felt the move of the Holy Ghost back 20 years ago and God told me this. Well, that's all well and good. But that's one word from God. And this is his book. And if the word that someone is given, by the way, if the prophecy that someone is given from God does, li does not line up with this book, they have been deceived. And they are in error. You see, if we go to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, so Solomon's writing, and he says, Hear, O children, the instruction of a father. Pay atten and pay attention and be willing to learn so that you may gain understanding and intelligent discernment. For I give you good doctrine. Do not turn away from my instruction. When I was a son with my father David, tender, and the only son in the sight of my mother Bathsheba, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get skillful and godly wisdom. Acquire understanding, act, which means actively seek spiritual discernment, mature comprehension, and logical interpretation. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. This Bible is the words from God's mouth. And God is our perfect Father. If we look at the Heart of God Fellowship mission statement, it says that we exist as a church to do four things. To worship, fellowship, inspire, and train. The way the Bible talks about discipleship, it's a training ground. See, there are things that we are and we are not supposed to do. There are lessons we're supposed to learn so that we know what to do and so we know what to run from. And training isn't easy, especially in the beginning. It's a spe and I think what's even harder is breaking a bad habit to train a, in a right one or a good one. But just ask a soldier. Training isn't easy at the beginning. But after the training comes a routine. And when training kicks in, you wouldn't know what to do otherwise. You don't even have to think. Your training kicked in. If we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 21 through 26, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things which are dishonorable, disobedient, and sinful, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, which means set apart for a special purpose, and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Run away. I like how it's not subtle. Run away from youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those believers who call on the Lord of a pure, out of a pure heart. But have nothing to do with the foolish and ignorant speculations, the useless disputes over unedifying, stupid controversies. I love how honest Paul is. It's unedifying, it's stupid, and it's useless. Run away from that. You don't need that. But since you know that they, because, 
stupid controversies, since you know that they produce strife and give birth to quarrels. I've got a fun story about that. I'm going to get back to this right now. When I took history of religion in college, I talked about teachers and now I'm remembering things. You see what happens. We talked about the Protestant Reformation, the church from the Protestant Reformation to current day. We focused a lot on the Roman Catholic Church because that's what the book was written about. But my teacher, I had a sub for that semester, and he learned at a Jesuit college, which happened to be Rockhurst, is where he learned. And the people he was in at, I'm sorry, it said a quarrel out of a stupid controversy or a useless dispute. They got into arguments. He had friends who would get into arguments, almost fistfights, over this question. Can you take Holy Communion with Doritos and Pepsi? They got into a fight. Can you take Dorito can Holy Communion be given with Doritos and Pepsi? It took all of my compassion and all of my self control not to tell him, well, it's kind of a stupid question. Who cares? But they they got into a fight about it. They give birth to quarrels, those stupid controversies and useless disputes. <laughs> The servant of the Lord must not participate in quarrels, but must be kind to everyone, even tempered, preserving peace. And he must be skilled in teaching, patient and tolerant when wronged. He must correct those who are in opposition with courtesy and gentleness in the hope that God may grant that they will repent and be led to the knowledge of the truth, not punching them in the teeth. Knowledge of the truth, accurately understanding and welcoming it. And that they may have come to their senses, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, having been captive by him to do his will. I talked about training kicking in. There was an interview with a soldier who was receiving a commendation. I think it was a silver star. Because under heavy fire where he was stationed. He escaped from a building, but his buddies were left inside. So he ran back in, rescued two or three of his buddies, and they were able to get out safely. And after he got his commendation, a reporter was talking to him. And she said, what were you thinking when you were doing that? Running back into, your, running back into that building, all that ammunition and those mortars and everything else going on? What were you thinking? And he told her. He said, I, I wasn't thinking. I guess my training kicked in. You give it enough time, your training will kick in. No matter what your training has been. If your training has been to be hateful and spiteful and petty, that'll kick in. If your training has been to run away from the stupid and useless, unedifying controversies, that'll kick in. If your training has been to do what Paul says when people are in error and to correct them gentle, gently with patient tolerance and compassion, that'll kick in. You see, God's clever and cunning enough to put us in situations where we have to rely on our training or just fail. And the Bible is full of examples of people failing. So if you mess up, you are in great company. Look around. We've all done it. You're in great company. I spend a lot of my time with me. It's really easy for me to not get prideful. I spend a lot of my time with me. I see every mistake I make. And if I don't see it, I have a wife who loves me enough to point it out to me. <laughs> if you want examples of people failing over and over, look at how Israel acted in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. Yes, Jonathan? Is it what? Yes, they are, they are mountainous. They are full of peaks and valleys, Jonathan said. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. For I do not want you to be unaware, believers, that our fathers were all under the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and they all passed miraculously and safely through the Red Sea. And all of them were baptized into Moses into his safekeeping as their leader in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, 
and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not well pleased with most of them, for they were scattered along the ground in the wilderness, because their lack of self-control led to disobedience, which led to death. Now these things, the warnings and admonitions, took place as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Do not be worshippers of handmade gods as some of them were, just as it is written in Scripture. The people sat down to eat and drink after sacrificing to the golden calf at Horeb and stood up to play, indulging in immoral activities. We must not indulge in or tolerate sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. We must not tempt the Lord, that is, to test his patience, question his purpose, or exploit his goodness, as some of them did, and they were killed by serpents. And do not murmur in unwarranted discontent, as some of them did, and they were sent... And they were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, they're not up there. My Bible has the reference notes for all of this. Most of it's in the book of Numbers, if you care to look. Now, these things happened to them as an example and warning to us. They were written for our instruction to admonish and equip us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you. That is c not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist, but along with the temptation he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. Therefore, my beloved, run, keep far, far away from any sort of idolatry that includes loving anything more than God or participating in anything that leads to sin and enslaves the soul. That's a lot of things Israel did wrong. That's a lot of things we run from. But Paul lays them out for us, and the New Testament Christians fell into those same traps of idolatry, murmuring, complaining, and general disobedience and rebellious hearts. You see, we have to accept that we don't know everything. And we require a master to teach us how to do things right. Another example I've got, think for a moment that if you wanted to start lifting weights, you and a buddy go to a gym that doesn't have the fancy new equipment or massage tables like some of the purple gyms out there today do. See, I remember the first time I lifted weights, I was in high school. I'm telling a lot of stories about me tonight. The first time I lifted weights, I was in high school. And we didn't have those fancy equipment outside of a rack that the bar sat on. And what we had was a field house by the track and, field, by the track and the football field that smelled like some unholy combination of sweat, dude stank, pain, and just a little bit of fear is what that room smelled like. And I don't know if you've ever been in one of those places. I try to avoid them now. I know you have. I had the class with you. But there are mirrors on each of the walls with the idea that you can see your technique. You can see what needs to be corrected. It also means you get to see what's going wrong and see what other people are doing. You see, I, I was in there with seniors who act like they've been lifting since they were in the womb. They were the football guys who ran and jumped and did whatever. I, I never did a sport. I, I was not built for sport. I was built for the buffet. So those guys are out there, and they're putting plates on the bar. They're doing bench presses, whatever they were doing to gear themselves up for their actual workout. And the guys I had lifted with, they, were all lift they had all lifted before, but we were pretty green. So we had to have the teacher watch us and to check our technique tell us what to do most of the time. See, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I like to think I'm pretty strong. See, I've always been big. you got to have strong legs when you're big or you don't get to move around much. So 
so we started, and the teacher tells us to start. We're doing bench press. I don't have a lot of upper body. Even still today, I'm good at using my lower body to fake upper body. I don't have a lot of upper body. And so he tells us that we're going to start on bench press. And we say, okay, what can I put on? Can I put on a plate? No. No, no, no. That's 135 pounds. You ain't ready for 135 pounds. You got to get technique down. Well, coach, I weigh 285. Well, it doesn't matter. One, 135 is too much. Well, can, can I put a 25 on? Just be 50 pounds on either side. I can do 50 pounds total on top of the five. No. No, that don't, that's 95 pounds. That's too much weight. Just the bar. What do you mean, just the bar? I don't. These guys are lifting 300 pounds. They're lifting more than I weigh, and you're telling me to do the bar? Yes, do the bar. It weighs 45 pounds. Just do the bar. Okay. Well, it's he's a different case. The bar was a third of his weight. It was substantially less than mine. Yes, half half your weight. Still, substantially smaller percentage for my weight. So we start doing just the bar for bench press, for clean and jerk, for squat. I was good at squat. Again, being big, you got to have strong legs. And so the bar weighed 45 pounds, and 45 pounds sounded like a joke compared to the 285 I weighed. Now, we had blocked scheduling, so we lifted for an hour and a half-ish. And I walked out of there to go change back into my clothes so I didn't smell like that place for the rest of the day. And I was sore every time I moved from a 45-pound bar just to get the technique down. Now, in a couple weeks, I got the technique down. I was able to put a little weight on, especially for squats, because strong legs. And I was able to lift more weight and more often and see the effects and as, I kept, as we kept lifting our little group, we had to listen to the teacher so we wouldn't hurt ourselves or the people we were working with. But if I hadn't had that teacher to tell me, you're going to kill yourself with 135 pounds, just do the bar, it would have went, Hoo! and I might have broken something. I might have hurt me. Now, I like me. I'm my favorite me. I've, I'm the only one of me that I have but I might have hurt me. I needed to listen to my teacher. If we go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 9, Paul writes, he says, If you point out these instructions to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished through study on the words of the faith and of the good Christian doctrine which you have closely followed. But have nothing to do with irrelevant folklore and silly myths. On the other hand, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, keeping yourself spiritually fit. For physical training is of some value, but godliness, which is spiritual training, is of value in everything and every way, since it holds promise for the present life and of the life to come. This is a faithful and trustworthy saying, full of acceptance, worthy of full acceptance and approval. So let's go back to the trade school idea for a moment. You're in, you are an apprentice electrician. Greener than a goose dropping, to put it correctly. And you are a day one, week one student. You know so little, you don't know what you don't know. It's your first test, and what you're supposed to do is wire a wall outlet. And you messed it up. And you did a great job messing it up. You kicked the breaker and it caught fire. So you go, you run, you turn the breaker off, and you get the extinguisher, put out the fire. Now, what would a good teacher do? Would a good teacher tell you to give back the tools, hang up your coat, leave forever, never come back? No. They'd kill the power. They'd help you kill the power, put the fire out, put their gear on, look over your shoulder to figure out where you messed up and show you how to do it right so that it didn't happen again. And then even if it did happen again, you messed up on the same test the next day, they're going to keep helping you. See, what breaks my heart about that is that people expect more grace out of a trade school teacher or a gym coach or a gym buddy than from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. They've been taught that if you screw up once, you're just out of the school. 
you're never going to come back. You fail one test, one assignment, and you will never be allowed to return. Well, if that's the case, i got to just leave because <laughs> I ain't qualified to be up here. But God's grace is new every morning. Being a disciple of Jesus isn't about acing the assignments and checking all the boxes. It's about learning from the master. As a disciple, you're going to fail. If you just started out, odds are you are going to do it well and often. It's okay. That's to be expected. It's important, though, that we keep learning and we keep moving forward, that we don't stagnate in our discipleship. Now, some of us get into the school early. We get saved early on, and that can be an advantage if you stick with it. It can also be a detriment if the person or people we were learning from were not good representatives of Jesus, or if we decide we want to ditch school for a while and we want to go out and do whatever the heck we want to do. See, Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way you should go, teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and, ta and talents. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Getting into the school early can be a good thing. But, you know, there's technically, I don't know how much you all know about trade schools or trades, but there's a middle level between an apprentice and a master. It's called a journeyman. An apprentice can learn from a journeyman as well as from a master. You see, when the teachings differ, though, the master supersedes the journeyman. Journeymen are the people, as far as the church is concerned, in the ministry of helps. They're the people who are in those five-fold church offices you hear about so much, the, pastor, the apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, and evangelist. They're the deacons and the elders. And to be perfectly honest with you, the most common journeyman I see is none of those things. It's a parent. The main difference between the journeyman and the apprentices is that they've been apprentices and disciples for longer and have learned and applied more knowledge than those that they instruct. Journeymen still learn from the master. No one but the master stops learning. In Philippians 1.6, see, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. You see, you've got to start somewhere. And if you've never started, I would recommend the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. And that beginning point is salvation. Now, if you're saved already, then look, to your bi look in your Bible. See, the New Testament, starting after Jesus' resur resurrection in each, each gospel, and even before, is jam-packed with instructions on daily living, money, family, marriage. You name it, the Bible has it. I specify the New Testament because sometimes in the Old Testament we get confused about what does and does not apply to us. We get plugged into a church. Get plug I'm sorry, not plugged into a church. Get plugged into the church that God calls you to be a member of. It's just as important that you be a member where God wants you to be a member as the people up on the stage and behind the pulpit are where God wants them to be. We do the work of the ministry... Because it can't all just be potlucks and card games. You've got to actually do some real work. We take our discipleship seriously, but not ourselves. I'll be honest, that's something I have to work on. You see, I'm still learning from Jesus, and it's part of what I love about that verse in Philippians. I'm done being worked on when I get to see Jesus, whether that's by rapture or me going on. And I am of the opinion that if it's not the rapture, I want to be taken out the way Elijah was. I want chariots of fire to come down, pick me up, and just go through that. That's all I want. I think it's simple. 
But if you've stalled in your education, you haven't been taking your time in the school seriously, God hasn't left you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's ready to pick up wherever you left off. And if you need some refresher, take some refresher. You might have taken a summer off, for all I know. I love that we serve a faithful and a true God. That he is loving and compassionate. That his mercy is new every morning. And he loves us enough to teach us the way we're supposed to do things. And we take what we learn and we try to help other people with it. I hope, I pray, I do believe that this evening has been beneficial. And I believe that God is able to use that message for whatever he needed to tell you. I don't know what God needed to tell you. I know what he needed to tell me. <laughs> but I believe that's been good seed scattered into good soil, that it'll take root, it'll bear fruit in our lives. And for the people watching online, more so than the people here, because I think I'm very confident about the salvation of the people who are here. I have never in my life seen Satan work this hard than he has since the start of 2022. I've had three people I cared for and cared about go home through a suicide and two people died of COVID-19. My wife spent time in the hospital last week. I have never seen Satan working this hard. And if you don't know Jesus, I'm begging you to give him a shot, to try Jesus. Because he loves you and he cares about you. And he, God moved heaven and earth so God could get to be in a relationship with you. See, Romans 10.9 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus, I'm sorry, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says you will be saved. Now we know God is patient and Jesus' return won't happen until the exact moment it's supposed to. The rapture when the church gets taken out of the world won't happen until exactly when it's supposed to. And only the Father knows when that's going to be. But God's not willing that any should perish, but some will. I don't want any, any of you to not be in heaven. Not just because I'm going to be there. I like me. I spend a lot of my time with me. But not just because I'm going to be there, because Jesus is going to be there. And it beats the crap out of the alternative. Because hell is a real place too. And the only thing that sends people to hell is the sin of unbelief. It's not lying or cheating or anything else you might care to think of. It's the sin of unbelief. Jesus loves you more than I could ever have the words for, that I could ever articulate. He does. God is your perfect father, even if your earthly father was horrible. God is your perfect heavenly father. I would beg you to start your relationship with Jesus if you don't know him already. We're going to go ahead and pray, and I'll speak a blessing. We'll be on our merry way. If you need prayer about anything, I'm going to hang out up here after the benediction. And if you feel like giving money, there's a plate behind me, or you can go online to heartofgodfellowship.com, the online giving tab. It's really easy to follow. God, thank you so much for the way that you love us. Thank you for being faithful and true. For completing the work that you started in us. God, I thank you that we get to learn from Jesus. That we have the Holy Spirit living in us to help nudge us and guide us when we're going through tests and trials and tribulations. I thank you for your living word that you speak to us through. I thank you for the body of believers 
and this family that the body of Christ is. God, I thank you for your joy and your peace and your patience and your comfort. God, I pray that the message today, tonight, that you would use it so that we would look more like Jesus and always say and do and act and think. That, Jesus, we would learn to love you better and to know you best. Know you better and love you best. Thank you, God. I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your joy, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. amen. That's a wonderful thing to hear. I love you all terribly. You can't stop me. Have a fantastic rest of your week. God bless you. Chris, would you mind hitting the button for me?